Hello and welcome to Doc Clay's Chemistry Lessons. Today we're going to be looking at AQA AS Level Chemistry Practical Skills Part 2. By the end of this lesson then you should be able to answer AQA AS Chemistry Practicals questions that cover errors in measurements, accuracy, precision and reliability, percentage yield, variables and graph drawing. To start with then we're going to look at errors in measurements and first of all we'll have a look at apparatus error and the apparatus error is defined by the error in a measurement divided by the measurement itself times by 100 and we'll have a look at an example here of a titration experiment so let's imagine we have a student who first of all weighs out 1.245 grams of a sample to make up a standard solution. Well, the error in that apparatus error here is going to be 0 0.001 divided by 1.245 because that's the measurement and multiplied by 100 giving an apparatus error here of 0 0.08 percent. Let's imagine now that that has been made up to 250 centimeters cubed in a volumetric flask. Well, the error in that measurement is going to be 0.1 centimeters cubed over 250, as that's the measurement, times by 100, giving us an error here of 0.04% in making the standard solution. Now, if that solution is going to be pipetted and imagine that was 25 centimeters cubed of that solution was pipetted into a conical flask well our error would be 0.1 because that's our pipette error in this instance which we're given over 25 times by 100 giving us a total percentage error apparatus error here of 0.40 percent and then the titration experiment was done and the average titer for that experiment was 23.30 centimeters cubed which would give an error in the burette reading of 0.15 just because that's our error for this particular burette over 23.30 times by 100 and that would give us an error here of 0.15 six four percent the total error then or our total apparatus error is the summation of all of our apparatus errors and that gives us one point one six percent importantly if we look at our experiment as well it identifies two areas where we could improve our experiment firstly in our burette reading 0.64% we could reduce the error here and the other major area here being in our pipette. Now there are two ways to decrease the apparatus error. We can either increase the measurement somehow or we could reduce the error in our equipment by using a more precise and accurate piece of equipment. So increasing the measurement here, somehow, if we were doing it in a titration, we'd have to use larger concentrations, perhaps. Concentrations, or we could use larger volumes. Both of which could end up increasing the measurement. Reduce the error, well, this might be, perhaps if you'd used, let's say, a measuring cylinder in the first instance well then using a pipette would improve the or reduce the error because the pipette is a more precise and more accurate piece of equipment using a burette as well would improve a reaction if you were just using two measuring cylinders so those ways of decreasing the apparatus error it's going to depend on the experiment that you're doing 
If you're doing a calorimetry experiment, for example, you might find a way of reducing the error by improving the insulation of your flask. The second error we're going to look at then is experimental error, which is defined as the real answer to an experiment minus experimental answer divided by the real answer. Let's imagine then from the previous example that we had a real concentration calculation and the real concentration of our acid perhaps was 0.101 moles per decimeter cubed and our answer that we found out experimentally was 0.0995 moles. Well, we divide again by the real answer, 0.101. Make sure you put your parentheses around the top part of the equation. Multiply by 100, and we would end up with a percentage experimental error here of 1.49%. Now this is important because in the previous window we looked at the apparatus error and we found the apparatus error was 1.16% and we are able to describe something about the accuracy of the experiment by comparing these two values. The accuracy then of the experiment, if our experimental error is less than the apparatus error, then the experiment is deemed to be accurate. This is important because if we look at the accuracy from our experiment above, our experimental error is 1.49%, which is greater than our apparatus error, which is 1.16%. Therefore, our accuracy here, or we're not saying that our experiment is very accurate and that we need to improve our experiment some way in order to improve the accuracy. Accuracy, precision and reliability. Accuracy then is how close we are to a true value and we have already described how we can determine if an experiment is accurate. And we have to come up with potential ways that we might be able to improve that accuracy. So as we've suggested, you might want to somehow increase the size of the measurement or find a way of decreasing the error in your apparatus. The next thing to consider then is the precision of your results. The precision then is a measure of the number of decimal places essentially your results are given to. And the smaller the scale, the higher the precision. Let's look at these titration results as an example. Normally we would try and give our titration results to, or our titer readings, to within plus or minus 0 0.05 centimeters cubed. Percentage yield then is the amount that we make of a substance divided by the expected amount we were hoping to make multiplied by 100. This topic has been met before so if you follow the link to the amount of substance section you'll be able to meet it again but let's just look at an example perhaps we made 90 grams of a substance an organic substance and we expected to make 100 grams then our yield would be 90%. And what we need to be aware of is reasons for loss or less than expected yield. And you might have reversible reactions occurring or there may be uh, other products made, so side reactions. Or you may have lost product through washings so you don't get a full yield, or there may have been escaped reactants somehow. That's going to depend on the reaction that you're doing and the experiment, so you need to be aware of perhaps gases being lost in a reaction, 
and you might want to stop those being uh, lost in some way or there may be a reversible reaction that you've not been aware of. Follow the link and have a look at some of the amount of substance section that I've written before. The next section then we're going to be looking at variables, we're going to be looking at control variables, independent and dependent and we're going to compare those and look at those with respect to an experiment we've seen already in one of our required practicals so measuring the rate of reaction as a function of temperature and this one is showing how the rate of reaction changes as a cross disappears. So we might want to do several different experiments and measure the rate of reaction and change in each of those experiments of the temperature at which we are doing the experiment. As the experiments change we're going to be measuring the time for the reaction in each case for the cross to disappear and in each experiment we're going to want to keep things the same such as the concentration and as well we're going to be wanting to keep the volume of the reactions or reactants sorry the same. What that means is the temperature here is a thing that is changing in the experiments and therefore that is our independent variable. The time here is our dependent variable and our concentration and volume are both examples of control variables which we are going to want to keep the same between experiments to make it a fair test. Generally speaking, most of these variables are types of what we call continuous and that means that they contain numbers whereas the other type that we can get in terms of variables, we might get categoric we tend not to get those so much in our chemistry in the AS level but these would be type, so we might have a type might be red green or blue or big small and little or you might get it in your organic chemistry you might name your organic substances as methane ethane propane they'd be a type perhaps continuous variables generally more useful here and they are numbers such as time and temperature okay the final section then we're going to look at is on graphs and how we draw them and how to make appropriate scales. We're going to look at this enthalpy change reaction where we're looking at calorimetry again and we're going to imagine here we've got a displacement reaction. So we might be adding here magnesium uh, to something like copper sulfate and we're waiting to see or observing the enthalpy change we make magnesium sulfate and copper at the end. And what we do is we mix the two solutions at four minutes and in this particular experiment we decided not to take a measurement at four minutes and then we continued measuring up until 10 minutes. So what we have along the bottom here is we've got time here and make sure we include any units and that is our independent that we're putting along the x-axis and then up the side we're going to have temperature and we're going to make sure that we include units here as well. Now the first thing you might go and do is you might start your scale at zero and we go all the way across up to 10 minutes we'd have in even spaces in between and our temperature scale we may go from zero to let's say 35 degrees Celsius up the side. The problem with that is it would give us a graph when we started plotting uh, which would be up here somewhere perhaps like that and the issue there is the data that we can get because actually from this experiment we want to measure this temperature change here the measurement that we could take for our temperature change would be quite small and that would increase our error so we need to choose a more suitable scale and ensure that our data covers a larger portion of the graph 
So for this particular experiment, we'd probably be better off having an initial scale at the bottom of maybe 19 degrees. And then we would be able to plot our points here. And we'd have uh, about 20, there'd be one. We're going to do them with nice crosses. Obviously, I've not got graph paper here. And clear using a sharp pencil. And then we'd have a jump up to maybe 31.5 here. At five minutes. We haven't got a four minute scale. Now, for this particular experiment, we draw two lines of best fit. We go across the bottom. And we also go down. These should be straight. I'm doing this freehand. And then at the fourth minute, which would be approximately here, we could then measure the temperature change, which would be between this point here and this point here. The change in temperature. We now have data, which is going to go into our expression for the energy consumption. Our value here, our measured change in temperature here, the measurement is as large as possible, reducing our experimental error. And we have covered and used as much of the graph paper as possible. The other thing this graphing indicates here is we have a point which doesn't fit the pattern and we have an anomaly because it doesn't fit the pattern. So make sure your graphs use straight lines, crosses for your points, you have suitable scales and that you have units for all of your axes. So just to recap then, you should be happy with errors in measurements and how we can use that to determine the accuracy of your experiment, how we deal with precision and reliability, percentage yield in experiments, and also variables and graph drawing. Follow the links to the required practicals so that you know which ones you've got to be able to apply these situations to. I'll see you next time. Bye for now.